Chapter 9 Shop Talk Even with everything I had been through, the alchemy I had witnessed, and the secrets about the world I had learned, there was something about walking down a hidden passageway to find an honest-to-goodness magic shop lurking in the shadows of an old building that made me giddy like a schoolgirl. But before I could even get situated, Emma and Nikki had already begun haggling over the price of the goods we required. We're always happy to extend a line of credit to the guild, Miss Patel, Emma Patel, second seat of the Pavonia table. Patel, Patel, that name sounds familiar. Uh, oh, you're the daughter of a cash Patel? I remember he came in here a few years ago when I just started working here after school. How is he? He's dead, but thanks for asking. Anyway, you were saying something about a line of credit? I didn't think the going rate for Alkahest was that high. What's Alkahest? I asked, and Emma rolled her eyes at my ignorance. Alkahest is the universal solvent, said Nikki. Dissolves anything it touches except bark spider silk, which is used to line the vial. And unfortunately, yes, there's been a dwindling of the quota that VAC releases to the market, and we can only buy so much. At the risk of my friend's eyes falling out the back of her head, I said, What exactly is VAC? Van Ash Corporation, said Nikki. I swallowed hard at the name. Van Ash Corporation could only mean one thing, that Rita Von Ash's legacy had lived on well past her death. And if this company wasn't part of the guild proper, it meant one more player out there in the shadows, along with whomever Frankie had been working for. They have a monopoly on some of the most valuable Prima Materia. Obviously, we have a lot of purchasing power, but there's only so much we can push. If you're done with the history lesson, Emma said, just tell me how much. 800 silver if you want the whole vial, said Nikki. Or 100 silver for a milliliter, but you need to bring your own vial. Are you fucking kidding me, said Emma. It was 50 silver a vial last year in New York. I'm sorry, ma'am, said Nikki. As I said, the supply on the market has constricted, and we can't... Yeah, 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 you need to make a living. But the guild will have my head if I go running up a line of credit like that without getting sign-off first. Let me get someone on the phone. Emma stormed out of the shop, and I heard her footsteps echo down the dark hallway until she was no longer visible. You have a branch in New York? I asked. Nikki nodded. Yep. Here, this lists all our locations, hours, and proprietors. She handed me a small laminated card with a picture of a woman standing in front of a row of tents in what looked like Union Square. I flipped it over to find the words, Welcome to the Night Market, written in flourishing script at the top, followed by a long list covering every major city in the country and some minor ones as well. But it was the one in the middle that caught my eye. I've been to this one, I said, pointing at the New York entry, which listed a certain stall in Hunts Point Market in the Bronx and a certain proprietor with half-moon spectacles and a very pronounced slouch. You've met Phineas? He's a legend. My grandmother had a tryst with him when she was my age, or so she claims. What's he like? He got the better of me, ended up trading everything I had, and what I received wasn't enough. I recalled the healing serum briefly curing Frankie, her cryptic words about the pearl and the triangle, and then the horror I felt as she turned back to stone. That had cost me Beatrice's entire supply of the mind-reading apples, and all it had bought us was the location of the fake gold token. And that token had literally exploded in our faces, leading to Beatrice's current exile. So needless to say, my past experience with the night market had not been a good one. Oh, well, he and my grandma are alike in that respect. They think we're still back in the days of haggling in the Capo di Fiori. Me, I like to take a more collaborative approach. Why make an enemy out of a customer over a single deal when there's a lifetime of transactions to be had? Sure, I guess. While we're standing here waiting for Miss Patel to finish whatever she's doing, do you have any glamours in your inventory that I could take a look at? Ooh, wish we did. You don't find those just lying around in the art market, I'm afraid. Why not? I asked. I thought they were relatively common. This was not an unreasonable proposition. What with how Ty had straight up given me one, and how Doug had coincidentally also had one. But now I knew there was more to the glamour than your typical mixture of prima materia. No, 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 they are most certainly not. 
I wouldn't quite characterize them as relic class objects, but it's a close call. Don't think there's been a new one created in at least a hundred years. What? Yeah, well, ever since the Treaty of Verdun outlawed alchemic experimentation on humans, it's not exactly like people are shouting from the rooftops that they've transmuted one. Oh, right, I said, pretending I knew what the Treaty of Verdun was. Thankfully, Emma saved me from asking any further embarrassing questions when she returned to the shop with a flourish. Let's go, she said to me. But what about the Alkahest, I said. Did the guild? We can talk about it over dinner. Thank you, Nikki. We'll be back. I'll show you both at no need, no need. We know the way. And then she grabbed me by the arm, and the magic shop faded from view as quickly as it had appeared. Of all the great restaurants in the city, this is where we have to go, I said, as a waitress arrived with three plates of oversized sushi stuffed with tuna and peanuts. First of all, don't insult the tuna peanut roll. It's amazing especially with the sauces on the side. Second, the booths in here are very comfortable. And third, we're guaranteed not to be seen by prying eyes. I turned around to scan the crowded restaurant, and sure enough, the table and booth arrangement was such that every diner was focused on their own meal. Fine, I said. But why did you order three of these? They're enormous. One for you, one for me, and one for him, said Emma, pointing behind me. I turned around to see the smiling face of J.P. Laurel making his way through the maze of tables toward us. What is he doing here? I asked. I invited him. Just now? When you went to call the guild? No, said Emma. Please, we all don't have hordes of Avorium at our disposal. We had scheduled this back in New York. What? Why? I whispered as J.P. drew closer, his silver cane in his right hand and that ridiculous cowboy hat still on his head. Because if it's a choice between you and him, no offense, I would choose him. You have a lot of spunk, I'll give you that, but you're still so... JP! Emma dear, said JP, with a warm smile on his face that soon turned to a slight grimace when he met my eyes. And Jade, you're here. When did you get to town? Emma asked, ignoring JP's displeasure at my presence. Took the shuttle up this morning, he said, sliding into the empty spot in the booth. There were a number of historical sites and in and around the city that I've been meaning to visit. It was rather enlightening. There is so much we still don't know about the early days of the guild during the revolution. JP picked up one of the sushi pieces, dipped it in the orange sauce, and then popped the whole thing in his mouth before waving off Emma's offer of chopsticks. No need, no need. Ever since I got back from Kyoto, I only use my fingers. Suit yourself, said Emma. So, I still have a tiny bit of alcohol left from Budapest, but I don't think it will be enough. And before I borrow the money from you to pay for a fresh file, I wanted to be sure it was worth it. Have you given some more thought to my plan? Yes, I have, and I think it's lacking in both practicality and creativity. You all aren't just going to be able to waltz into the library, pour some alcohol on the box, and waltz out with the vial of dragon's blood. Come on, Emmy, I know you have a better head than that. I snickered at the nickname, and they both glared at me. And what, pray tell, are you laughing at? asked JP. I don't think you realize how fortunate you are that Emma here even let you come on this raid. If it was me that Dahlia paired you with, I would have slipped something in your drink at the start, and by the time you woke up, I'd already be on my way back to New York with the vial. JP, enough. Jade here actually has come up with a very clever infiltration plan. It's me that's lagging. I looked over Da's notes a hundred times. Blunt force seemed like the only thing he hadn't considered. Yes, well, you do that and the box will probably implode, taking you and half the block with it. Fuck, that's what I thought. But don't worry, don't worry. Your Uncle Jippy has come to the rescue in your direst time of need. I looked at Emma, expecting her to snap at his blatant condescension. But all I saw was warm admiration on her face as she picked up a piece of sushi with her chopsticks and started smearing it with both of the sauces. Whatever this relationship was between them, it was deeper than I had realized. Thank you, JP. So, what's the plan? It's simple, really. We create a replica of the box and then swap it with the real one, which you'll put into your bag. And then one of my people will be waiting to extract it on the other end immediately. 
Emma paused for just a second, and the sushi fell from her chopsticks, but she quickly picked it up and ate it in one bite. How? Well, the abrupt distant separation could, in theory, break the origin link, but that still doesn't solve the problem of actually opening the box. Trust me, darling, that bitch won't care if we hadn't opened the darn thing, long as we have it. We'll figure out that part later, if need be. Then you think? Yes, this was meant as a fool's errand for all of us. You included, Miss Peters. My head popped up at the mention of my fake last name, and I hesitated slightly before deciding to risk further embarrassment. Your bag. It's linked to a place? Emma and JP both shot looks at each other before JP nodded. Yes, said Emma, sliding one of her ring-adorned hands toward me on the table. My family's ancestral domus. These rings, and others, help pull free whatever I need at the moment. And it exists in a real place? Like in some sort of storage unit? Not something so obvious, but yes. And we got the location of the physical entrance from all others. Which you can whack from my associate's pretty little head just as soon as he gets back from wherever that is, said JP. It's it somewhere in India, I imagine. I saw Emma start to shake her head, but she stopped herself before completing the thought. Don't. And my family hasn't lived there in seven generations. My apologies, said JP. I just wanted to know what sort of travel time we were dealing with. I, I need some time. We don't. We never. I understand and remain at your disposal, Emmy dear. Now, I hate to eat and run, but I need to be getting back to the missus. We'll talk tomorrow once you've had the night to think it through. JP leaned over to give Emma a kiss on the cheek, which she received with a slight smile, before he tipped his hat to me and stalked off. I excused myself a minute later to use the restroom, but when I returned, Emma was staring off into space. Are you okay? I asked with trepidation as I slid back into the booth. She didn't acknowledge my presence, and I looked down to see that her hands were trembling. I'll just go pay then. Do you want me to... You know what? I'll see you back at the hotel. A different me would have stayed, would have tried to coax the source of her angst out of her, so I could offer some words of comfort. The current incarnation of myself, however, wanted to give her a slice of the lone mind-reading apple left from my visit to the orchard that was tucked in the recesses of my bag and forced my way into her thoughts for my own edification. I felt my hand slipping quietly down to my side and brushing against the false bottom. Whether it was directed by my baser self or by Jade, I wasn't sure, but I didn't want to stick around to find out. So I took the coward's way out and left the sobbing girl to her troubles and her sushi.